this make sure that this doesn't. This presentation is the culmination of like probably about a year of work across both um, the Big Data Innovation Team, of which I am a member, and uh, multiple students and professors, some of them are in the room, uh, at the University of Toronto Transportation Research Institute. Um, uh, not all of the work uh, of which has made it into this presentation because there was really a lot. Um, so, the outline for the 40 slides I'm going to present today, brief history of the bylaw, um, our descriptive analysis of trends and patterns, um, our work uh, modeling um, the paths that vehicles take, or that the paths that private transportation company vehicles take within the city in order to estimate the volumes of them on the streets, uh, an analysis of curb impacts, and uh, a very deep presentation on some of the work that Nutri did, looking at mode choice and the relationship with transit. Which I did before this writing. So, um, prior to 2014, taxis were allowed to operate in the city of Toronto, and nobody else was uh, in terms of uh, kind of private transportation. Um, in September of 2014, Uber decided to. Um, enter the city and, and operate. Uh, the city said, that's illegal, uh, took it to the court, and lost. So city council had to uh, come up with a regulation, I guess, allowing them to uh, operate within the city. So May 2016, a bylaw was passed, um, and then they kind of officially were allowed to operate starting in uh, September of 2016. A uh, year and a bit after that, in December of 2017, Uber's main North American rival, Lyft, launched. Um, and then from mid-2018 to mid-2019, um, municipal licensing and standards and uh, ourselves were working on this um, evaluation project to look at holistically kind of what are the what have been the impacts um, on the city from this update in 2016, um, which ultimately kind of made its way through uh, bureaucracy in order to be presented at council on the final day of council, July 20, uh, July 18th of this year, in which uh, an updated bylaw was passed, which I will get to at the very end of this presentation. So. Uh, a part of what got passed in May 2016 demanded the outcome of a study that assesses and measures the impacts of the volume of private transportation company vehicles and drivers. Um, so just so you know, uh, in the city of Toronto, we call um, ride hailing or ride sourcing or transportation network companies private transportation companies or PTCs. So I will be saying PTC over and over. Um, after that, and I mean Uber and Lyft, um, and the Vehicle for Hire bylaw broadly regulates taxis, limousines, and uh, private transportation companies. So, as part of this uh, transportation impact study, um, we were trying to answer three broad questions. What are the trends and patterns in um, Vehicle for Hire travel since this bylaw passed? Um, how has this impacted the transportation network, or how have these changes impacted the transportation network, and um, what are the impacts on uh, travel demand and travel choices? Um, we, the city doesn't collect any data on taxis, so despite the, um, an element of the study wanting to look at both the vehicle for hire industry broadly, um, this was ended up only being focused on private transportation companies because they were the ones who had to provide us the data. So uh, here's a broad series of uh, some of the things we were trying to look at in terms of understanding trends and patterns. The main thrust is um, this has been growing rapidly. Um, 
since Uber was allowed to operate in September 2016, with days started at 62,000 trips a day, and this has grown by 180% to March of this year at about 180,000 trips a day, and is likely still growing. Um, at a pretty um, so, over half of trips uh, start downtown, and um, have, as well, doubled um, in the past year of downtown. Um, I guess growth in the suburbs started off slower, but it's been increasing rapidly, if you want to look at uh, percent changes. Um, but I guess broadly uh, across the city, all of this activity is very heavily concentrated, both downtown and at kind of key transportation nodes and uh, other uh, kind of points of interest within the city, those being Yorkdale, uh, Humber Bay Shores, Sherway Gardens, the airport, Woodbine Racetrack, and uh, and beer. Um, and even within downtown, um, the kind of intersections with over 200 pickups per day are uh, pretty heavily concentrated in the financial district, Eaton Center, uh, unfortunately along line one, um, and then kind of the pre village in King West. So, um, this shows the broad kind of time of week uh, trip pattern um, with a trip rate per hour. Uh, Friday and Saturday nights are still, um, or are the busiest times, but we do see a pretty noticeable commuting peak um, in both the AM and the PM peak, which represents about half of uh, the overnight peak of uh, 15 to 10,000 vehicles. Um, and uh, what I guess what is kind of concerning is that um, that weekday commuter and weekday midday kind of trip rates are increasing pretty rapidly um, for some degrees just as much as Friday and Saturday night um, and the trip rates are becoming somewhat substantial um, we have an interesting, and the color does not come out quite as nicely. It's supposed to be a much more pleasant orange than uh, this uh, more, I guess, later fall brown. Um, so what we're seeing is, uh, if you're comparing the ratio of um, these two different uh, kind of principal time periods, like commuter trips and uh, Friday and Saturday night. Um, the ratio of those two trips uh, skews much more heavily towards commuter trips in um, the outer suburbs um, and kind of away from the subway lines. And then downtown, um, is much more heavily skews towards um, those overnight nocturnal party trips. Um, which is not to say that there is not a lot of commuting trips downtown. Did you go uh, back, baby? It, yes. Sorry. It says four times more commuter pickups than otherwise? Yes. And it says one times more night pickups than otherwise? What's the otherwise in the blue? Um, oh, so the blue is like four times as many, it's the ratio, either end of the axis is the ratio of um, commuter trips to Friday and overnight trips, or so Friday and Saturday trips. Maybe it's four to one more night pickups than one to four. Uh, yeah, I guess that, uh, yeah, so it, well, the bar is commuter versus Friday and Saturday, and those two labels um, are trying to indicate that 
that end of the bar is more commuter trips, and the other end of the bar is more friendly trips. So there are four times more, four to one ratio more for night pickups for two, not one to four. Yes. But um, you just have to reverse the label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I will say that like the extreme ends of the bar are not, um, you know, like not occurring in a lot of places. Um, so the average wait time across the city is under four minutes, with uh, wait times being um, lower downtown and, well, probably lower when the, where the most activity is, which is, again, downtown and at um, key transportation nodes. Um, since shared ride requests have been um, available, about 26% um, of all trips um, are requesting a shared ride. Um, and those tend to be, again, or like there's a higher proportion of those uh, outside of downtown and uh, away from the subway lines. Um, but um, a lot of the times those trips aren't actually shared because they're not actually getting uh, matched or they haven't, there aren't like multiple pickups or drop offs within a same trip. That, I guess, doesn't mean that there aren't multiple people occupying a vehicle. Um, in fact, none of the data that we have is able to determine the occupancy of the vehicle or the number of people making a trip, one kind of customer trip together. So that was a high level overview of the kind of the trends we were seeing. Um, I'll now embark on the network impacts. Um, in order to examine or try to tease out um, whether this activity is causing congestion, we wanted to know um, where are the volume of vehicles of private transportation company vehicles most uh, significant. And uh, the data that we were getting uh, at the city of Toronto um, was only the trip origin and destination records and the timestamps of origin and destination. Um, so we embarked on uh, a bit of a modeling exercise in order to determine um, the path uh, that the vehicle is taking um, during a trip, and then also the path that the vehicle, that the driver may be taking from one trip to the next trip. Um, the companies were nice enough to um, provide us with uh, a sample of the number of uh, drivers that are active. So uh, a big number that's been, got talked about a lot uh, in the media was the number of licensed drivers in the city of Toronto, but uh, these companies tend to license, if, if someone signs up to drive within the GTA, the company will just license them to operate in every city within the GTA. And so of the 90,000 drivers who are licensed to operate in the city of Toronto, um, only about 14,000 of them, thousand of them are, oh, sorry, fewer than 10,000 of them are active at any given time. Um, and so this graph shows um, our range of estimates for the number of active drivers and then uh, the actual number of um, trips that were made for those uh, specific dates that we got data for. Um, so this number could potentially come up again uh, in terms of uh, discussions of whether we need to cap the number of licenses or cap the number of vehicles 
um, that are uh, that can be operating at any time um, on the city streets in order to figure out what would be or try to tease out what would be the impact on uh, the service. Um, my colleague Charles also uh, had a bit of an examination for the data for which we got um, the number of drivers and the number of trips, showing that the number of active drivers scales pretty linearly with um, uh, the number of trips that are occurring. So in order to um, estimate the volume of uh, vehicles on the city streets. This is the approach we took. Um, so as mentioned before, we routed trips from origin to destination. And then uh, my colleague tested a number of optimization uh, algorithms in order to uh, come up with solutions for um, which trips could have been made by uh, a same driver. Um, and then we routed those segments as well, and then aggregated that up, <coughs> uh, volumes of PVCs, and then compared that with uh, traffic, traffic volumes, and then uh, compared that to congestion metrics, and looked at uh, growth trends. Um, so this is an explanation of how we did that. We get the origin and the destination. We put that through uh, routing engine called PG routing in our database um, to get the shortest path from origin and destination. And then uh, from one destination, we have multiple feasible subsequent trips that that driver could have made. Um, and kind of approximating um, the algorithms, algorithms that the companies themselves use based on um, engineering talks that some of their uh, employees have given. Um, we choose a candidate subsequent trip and then route for that in order to get the um, uh, path from destination to the subsequent origin. Um, and then we aggregated this up to um, uh, the city's neighborhoods to determine um, the proportion of um, vehicle volumes uh, that in each of these neighborhoods for kind of the 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, we did this actually for 24 hours. Um, sorry, what, what is the proportion of vehicle volumes within this neighborhood that are private transportation companies? Um, and so the busiest neighborhood is Chinatown, Kensington, and about 8% of um, the traffic is uh, private transportation companies during the day. Compared to um, some of the other cities in North America, um, New York City has over, in Manhattan, over 30% of um, their traffic is uh, private transportation companies. So we are uh, kind of nowhere near yet um, the level of um, activity that those other cities are experiencing, but also we have kind of been a, a bit of a late adopter. Well, yeah, we're a bit behind their growth curves. And so comparing um, the travel time data that we get from Bluetooth sensors downtown and looking at the um, ratio using October 2017 as our baseline, um, we see some amount of fluctuation uh, over time, but uh, no kind of obvious trend um, that one could see based on uh, potential, like, I guess, five to ten, nine percent increase in uh, vehicle volumes. Uh, if one were assuming 
that all of this private transportation company activity was new vehicle volumes, which it isn't, which I'll get to in two more sections. Uh, but first, um, so the data that we receive for uh, privacy reasons is snapped to um, intersections, um, any intersection within the city, um, and uh, we would also like to learn about more localized impacts of um, where this pickup and drop off activity happens. So there's a nonprofit called the uh, Open Transport Foundation, I think. We just really know them as shared streets. We've been uh, developing uh, an open source toolkit and, and language to allow um, greater communication between private transportation companies, navigation companies, and cities in order for us to share kind of similar maps. And one of their projects has been around providing their company drop off data to city agencies in order for us to understand the impacts at a curb level. So they get data from uh, multiple companies and then um, kind of spatially and temporally aggregate them so that the city agency can't pick out any um, individual company or any even individual trip from the data set. Um, and so this means that we have a 10 meter spatial resolution and a minimum one hour uh, resolution and there's a threshold where um, if there are too few trips that meet, uh, sorry, that occur within that kind of 10 meter buffer or that whichever time period we chain, uh, select, then we um, don't see it. The interesting uh, quirk about how they're um, processing pickup and drop off data is that they are determining the side of the street based on the direction the vehicle was traveling, and assuming that the vehicle always pulls over to the right in order to drop off because the GPS signals are not precise enough for them to determine which side of the street the pickup or drop off occurred. Um, which does mean for one-way streets, um, where you can in fact access the curve on one side of the street, but for example, on Richmond and Adelaide, there's a bike lane on the right side, um, the, our estimates of where this activity is happening are a little bit um, quirky. So we are uh, steadily digitizing the um, street level bylaws within the city. Um, all of these are passed by council, so they exist kind of as text um, and then as signs, um, but neither of those uh, kind of data sets is actually digital and uh, spatially referenced. Um, so this extent represents the study 72% of uh, all pickup and drop off activity in the city. So a good sense of where the conflicts are or where the conflicts could be. Um, and so we looked at a few specific bylaws mostly around uh, pickup and drop offs and, uh, sorry, no stopping zones and bike lanes. An interesting quirk about the city's bylaw is that taxis are allowed to stop in many places that personal vehicles or private vehicles are not. So taxis are allowed to stop in any uh, no stopping zone where it's safe. Um, and in order to pick up or drop off a passenger, and uh, private transportation companies are not. Um, so we can see that there's like a pretty heavy concentration along A and uh, approaching Adelaide. Um, yeah. Um, and we would also think that this is an indicator of a uh, pretty high volume of this activity from taxis as well. Uh, but I'm clear. Uh, basically, similar map for bike lanes. Um, again, a lot of activities happening uh, 
a lot of Adelaide and uh, near St. George Campus. Um, so we partnered with Premier Ivory Tower, um, and uh, really a, a large number of uh, students here, only some of whom are going to appear at this presentation. Um, I strongly encourage you to seek out their theses, um, because they're going to go a lot more in depth than what I'm about to present. Um, and Two of the things that we were looking at was um, where people who are taking private transportation companies in order to um, make trips with those companies, um, what would they have done otherwise, and kind of who uh, are they? And then um, for um, what are the impacts, or what could be the impacts on public transportation? Um, and looking at uh, really like what what would the transit alternative have been for uh, the exact same trip, um, which I find kind of cool. So Wenting used like the transit schedule for uh, six months of activity from September 2016 to April 2017, um, which were the was the time period for which we had uh, wait times for. Uh, PTC trips, and then after that, um, they stopped providing the city that information. Um, and so, used uh, a random sample of trips over those six months, which was like tens of millions of trips. And then, uh, with the schedule for the exact same like request time, looked at what the transit alternative would have been and compare wait time, access time, well, you know, yeah, wait time, access time, and then kind of overall trip time, and uh, what the modes were in. Anyway, first, only slide on um, the survey that Patrick conducted. Um, about 50% of people who responded to the survey said for their most recent trip, they would have taken transit instead um, if the private transportation company hadn't been. Um, available, uh, and then another third would have said that they would have taken a taxi. Um, this cannot directly translate to 50% of all trips could be, um, would have been transit because um, people do not use private transportation companies in a uniform amount. I'm sure there are super users who would have just been super users of taxis. Now they are super users of Uber. <clears throat> um, distribution of the best available transit alternative to the PTC trips that uh, went and looked at. And then in order to have something to compare to, uh, we looked at the distribution of transit trips per the tr Transportation Tomorrow Survey. Um, and um, so I guess not surprisingly, um, fewer trips are would have been kind of directly competitive with the subway, which makes sense in a relatively congested city. Thankfully, the subway is probably still faster than um, spending quite a bit more money on a private vehicle. Um, I think the the bit of a surprise is uh, in terms of um, the 
these companies are not replacing kind of the more onerous transit trips, the transit trips that require numerous transfers or transferring from bus to subway. Um, they would appear to be occurring along heavily frequented bus and streetcar roads. Granted, we don't include kind of um, We don't know the precise location of the request, so there could be some kind of local geographic like porosity things that could come into the, the equation of like, maybe it's particularly challenging for someone to walk to their local or closest bus station, bus stop or streetcar stop, um, as opposed to just getting uh, a vehicle at their door because of the quirks of the, the data that we're dealing with. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, somewhat surprised. And also, the overall benefits don't seem that large for a somewhat more expensive mode. Chris? Uh, just a quick question about the previous slide. Um, it, it might be that, or rather a comment, um, it might be that the numbers would change a little bit if you accounted for the PTC trips that are actually then destined to the subway or like a go station because there did seem to be a fair concentration of them. Yeah. Oh. Yes. I know that would be like a whole other level of analysis, but it might explain some of this. That is uh, fair. So um, I forgot to mention during commuter times, 12% um, of trips occurring um, outside of Toronto and East York. Uh, appear to be to subway stations. Uh, so that could, in fact, the combination could sneak into this combination of those. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, this is here in the trip time, so we can sign the this includes wait times. Yes. So, sorry, what's the variable? So this is for um, for each trip that in the sample. Um, the best available transit alternative for that trip would have taken, on average, starting from that TAS, um, that amount of time. It's transit travel time over PTC travel time. Uh, yeah, minus. Weighted or unweighted? And this is also unweighted. Unweighted. Yeah, not not mm -hmm. taking into account like more substantial penalties from transferring or like people experience waiting uh, worse than they do in the vehicle travel. Yeah, no, this is unweighted. Um, and I guess again, kind of no surprise in the downtown core and along the subway lines, um, your best available transit alternative is not going to take that much longer. So how did you get the travel transit travel? Um, by uh, using an open source transit router with the schedule uh, for the same period, and saying, assuming if the person was starting their transit trip at the same time that they requested the private transportation company trip. So we match the uh, PTC times. So the transit trip starts at the origin of the trip or the centroid of the task? Uh, the, the origin of the trip, which unfortunately in this case is at, at an intersection. So I guess 
Yeah, this is also missing a, a small element of this delta is that someone is probably having to walk from their house to get to that intersection. And the, the center of the no. And the PVC travel times are from what origin to the same. same nearest centroid or the location? Um, it's the, based on the trip record. So the PVC. that's it. But you have origin XY coordinates for the PTC trips. We have yes, but they're to an intersection. To an intersection. Okay, so the XY coordinates are to the nearest intersection. And so is this transit one as well. Yes. And then the destinations are always also to the nearest station. Intersection. Intersection. Sorry, that's the nearest intersection. And so how did you get the travel times for PTC then? It's based on the trip. So you did not estimate the travel time for PTC, but you estimated the travel time by transit. Yes. So the travel time by PTC are observed, travel time by transit are estimated. Correct. Very important fact, yeah. Thank you. This next slide will- A little slow on these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This next slide will, in fact, demonstrate a quirk of that. So 15% of the trips that uh, went in uh, routed the best available transit alternative based on the schedule would appear to have been faster. However, um, an analysis that she did of the actual, um, based on the reported distance of the, the PTC trip and the reported kind of time it took, um, would indicate that those were under more congested conditions. And so I would infer that scheduled transit trip would not have actually been faster because it would probably have also been affected by congestion. <coughs> may, may I just, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so these are scheduled transit times, they're not yes. actual transit times, so it doesn't kind of come into play. Yes. Correct, yes. It, it's sort of an anomaly. If, I don't have the data, but I heard uh, Queen's University PhD students speak about it that if you take all the origins and destinations through census tracts from Canadian census in 2016, there was not a single OD pair where transit travel time was faster than automobile travel time or work commutes recorded in the 20% Canadian census data. And what it means to me, is, which makes sense, is given the physics of walking, waiting, access, and transit, it is hard to imagine that well, transit could be faster unless you, like in my case, I live on top of a transit station, work yeah. on top of a transit station. Still, it takes me eight minutes to leave my office and get to get to this train and border train. So much. It's a bit anomaly. I think more about it. Yeah, I mean the. I, My memory is that, like, on average, the vehicle speeds of PTCs are on the order of 20 kilometers an hour. And for these slower than transit trips, it was more on the order of 10 kilometers an hour. So, so what is meant by time? Is it includes access time from where you are to the station? To the, or is it just the increase of travel time? It does include the access time, but the access time is based on from the intersection. And then the egress would also be from the intersection to the destination. Or the desti intersection. No, the is intersection the is the origin and the destination. So there Which is Which in BTC's case could be much different. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, when you apply the weights this will this will dissipate, yeah. All this will dissipate. Um, also, for 7% um, of the trips that um, were routed through this, um, walking would have actually been faster than taking transit as an alternative. 75% um, of those were less than a kilometer and a half long, and they tended to be overnight in downtown. <coughs> Um, indicating 
that PTCs may be taken as an alternative to kind of walking at night for safety reasons, or even taking prints at night for safety reasons. Um, so we also used the uh, pickup and drop-off data to look at subway delays. Wenting did a much greater analysis of subway delay, which I do not include a slide of. Um, but noting that like for all subway stations during a delay, there's a pretty noticeable increase in activity of um, I guess pickup activity in the vicinity. Um, our sample of pickup and drop-off data um, was uh, only for nine weeks. <coughs> And um, this was the longest delay we could observe, where we have um, about a 50% increase in pickup and drop off around College Station, where uh, the delay was going to be. Um, we did not look at other kind of network impacts, um, so we only looked at the station, based on the TTC's delay data, the station where the delay occurred, um, and not kind of other locations where that could have probably impacted. Um, the two takeaways from this would be that <clears throat> PTCs do provide kind of some increased resilience in the network um, that they are an alternative to subway during delays, but also that their increased activity in the presence of subway stations can uh, negatively, negatively impact shuttling efforts. <coughs> um, to try to move passengers. Finally, we presented this big honking uh, report, uh, as well as bunch of other things to uh, committee and then council and then um, council uh, at least from kind of the perspective of this report uh, approved the maintenance of the status quo but um, required greater uh, data provision from both private transportation companies and also demanded that data now be provided by taxi companies. And um, <coughs> sorry, uh, demanded that we continue to monitor the impact of vehicle kilometers traveled, uh, traffic congestion, and greenhouse gas emissions, um, and explicitly answer the question, should council cap the number of uh, private transportation company licenses? On the uh, kind of pickup and drop-off activity area, um, they would once again like us to know, is it feasible to require companies to route their drivers um, so that they don't stop in no stopping zones broadly, which includes adjacent to or inside of bike lanes, if that's a no stopping zone. Um, I will say municipal licensing and standards um, kind of responded um, that uh, it would be incredibly hard to regulate from the city's perspective um, to know if, if a, a driver is stopping where they shouldn't be, um, was it the app telling them to do that or was it them, telling them, them deciding to do that um, and that also the like, bylaw enforcement officers that a municipal licensing standard employs can only enforce bylaws relative to uh, the vehicle for hire bylaw broadly, and um, kind of they can't enforce traffic bylaws. And. Um, Yes. 
know that more and more often uh, Ubers and Lyfts are getting $150 tickets for stopping in bike lanes. Wouldn't that just be the answer, just regular policing um, for traffic infringements? It's, yeah, unanswered. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, yeah, and then um, kind of we could be providing this information for that kind of enforcement of laws. Of, of, of. Yes, go ahead. Um, the no stopping thing seems not granular enough. I mean, there's like, like I know there's park, taxis can now park in front of fire hydrants, which are like no stopping zones. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, and there's worse, so there's worse levels of no stopping zones. So those ones where kind of cars always go, and then there's terrible ones like right in front of a crosswalk, right, which is where they tend to be usually. So since we can assume that the, the, the parking thing is already overloaded, we can almost assume that all the time, whenever Uber is making a drop off, they're doing it illegally, right? I mean, you know, because everything's packed. And that one thing you said about their impact on 9% on, 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 on congestion or, or, or volume or whatever, have, have they replaced car traffic or are they just added to that? Because I mean, if we're, we're already at 100% capacity on our road system, so another 10% is critical. So it's not a small thing, like you said. So that was it. Yeah. Um, probably less than 50% of trips would be kind of new vehicular activity, but then even that, there may be a bit of subtlety where that like 8 to 9% was for like one specific neighborhood. For all of downtown, it's more closer to like 5 to 8% on a like neighborhood by neighborhood basis, and that's like the volume of like the total volume of vehicles in that neighborhood, and then the proportion that's uh, private transportation. Companies. Where so sorry so I would say where I, where I would estimate that less than fifty percent of that is new is because uh, fifty percent of a respondent to fifty percent of respondents to the survey that Utrecht conducted asking for your most recent trip what would you have taken otherwise? Uh, about 50% said a mode that would have been a different kind of vehicle mode, and the other 50% said uh, transit walking or cycling. But I would assume that the people who said transit walking or cycling take PTCs less frequently than the people who said a uh, different kind of driving mode, in particular taxis. Well, one other thing is that, like, they say, well, if they replace car trips, it's a good thing, so they're really not creating traffic. But most car trips that they're replacing tend to go directly to a parking lot, so they don't impact the no stopping zones or yeah. the light Ubers. So you have to remember, every Uber trip is a curb drop off, yeah. so it's going to have that kind of impact where the, the, the trips it's replacing might have been, you know, the guy would drive to the underground parking lot, he wouldn't get in the way of anybody. Yep. So that's an important thing to say that these trips are all, all having massive impacts on the curbs, more so than the ones they're replacing. So it's not a fair sort of thing to say, well, we replaced the car trip, so it's good. Right? Yeah, there's, um, we did not get a chance to look at the impacts on vehicle ownership uh, within the state of Ohio. I think there's preliminary evidence or a study from the US that was looking at some national survey data um, showing that there's decent evidence that it has led to a reduction in car ownership. Um, I only read the abstract. Um, okay. I was going to say something else, but now I forgot. Don't worry, it'll come back to me. We have time for one more question. It's almost 12 o'clock. Sure. How about the demographic characteristics and the, for the origin and destination and its <coughs> effect on? the total number of trips that were requested by PTC? Um, so the U-Tree survey did look at uh, the demographics of uh, respondents and the demographics of people um, who take private transportation companies. They also did a comparison with the Transportation Tomorrow survey. So um, 
people who take PTCs tend to be, I think, more affluent and younger than people who take taxis. Um, that's all I can remember. There's more in our report. Um, and we did look at, uh, from a, attempting to like look at equity within the city, and we looked at uh, trip characteristics for trips that originate uh, within neighborhood improvement areas versus the rest of the city. And for the most part, there isn't a huge difference between like wait time and trip rates. The only pretty significant dis difference is for the Toronto and East York, um, there are about twice as many trips per person being made from the non-neighborhood improvement areas versus the neighborhood improvement areas. But that made it. It's still like the neighborhood improvement areas are taking probably twice as many trips as like people outside of Toronto and East York. And it's mostly like, like there are 120 trips being made per month, I'm guessing, for 1,000 people in Toronto and East York. Like the trip rate is like four times the rest of the city. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Rob. Thank you.